building society, as the name suggests. We are not a bank, uh, but it's a unique uh, arrangement because we do have a banking license, so we, we take deposits. We are owned 100% by the government of the Republic of Zambia. And similar to our colleagues in South Africa, the intention was really to use us to reduce the housing deficit in Zambia uh, through the provision of um, uh, mortgage financing. So that, that's where we fit into the ecosystem for housing. In terms of um, our successes uh, in the recent past, uh, we have uh, re-established the mortgage industry in Zambia. Uh, we are the largest uh, mortgage finance institution. Uh, yesterday we heard uh, from our friends at uh, Home Loan Zambia, the high interest rates in Zambia, 26%. Uh, uh, if you go a little back in the past, it used to be 200 and something percent. Uh, so that, that just wiped out the, the mortgage industry in our country, uh, which needed to be reestablished. Uh, uh, so you find that our portfolio is still small, but it's growing. Uh, we have 1,500 mortgages, which are less than uh, 10 years uh, old. Another success uh, story is uh, we introduced uh, a mortgage product specifically for women. And we, we felt this was uh, something we needed to do uh, in order to reestablish uh, home ownership uh, you know, uh, in, in a real sense. Uh, we've also uh, had another success as a public institution. Uh, we are uh, the first to go to the market uh, with a medium-term note issue, uh, which, uh, uh, as we speak, uh, is, is on a roadshow. We hope that uh, we will attract uh, a number of investors into this note program. So those are some of the successes. We've doubled our balance sheet in the last four years. Uh, our balance sheet size is not just over $100 million. Uh, uh, which for us is quite a significant milestone. Now, addressing uh, the issue really in terms of what, what, whether we are an, uh, a liability or, or an asset, uh, uh, let me look at some of the challenges that we have faced and how we've addressed these challenges. Uh, first and foremost, we have found that uh, you know, the housing uh, problem is a very complex problem. It's multifaceted. Uh, you hear that uh, you know, affordable financing is one of the key components, uh, one of the main reasons why the housing market has not grown. We believe that uh, there are other uh, reasons. Uh, security documentation, uh, you heard yesterday that uh, a number of properties still don't have security documentation. Like our colleagues, we have intervened here. We've appointed uh, lawyers who work with our clients to to process uh, title deeds on their behalf. Secondly, we are the only institution that accepts uh, what are called uh, occupancy licenses uh, or uh, documents that are issued by local authorities uh, to show that uh, there's ownership of the property. This is important because uh, in most of the peri-urban areas, uh, you know, you find that these households do not have proper uh, facilities in terms of uh, roads. So the local authority is quite key in determining who actually owns this property and uh, survey the land. So we have accepted this and this has helped us to, to uh, grow our uh, market segment. The other aspect which uh, may be uh, common across Africa, uh, I mean, uh, we find that there is a stigma attached to uh, mortgages, uh, especially after the uh, high interest rate regime where a lot of people lost properties. Uh, so a number of people are actually afraid to take a mortgage. So we need to step in to provide um, uh, public awareness campaigns, uh, literacy campaigns, uh, to re-educate the, the public that uh, uh, actually you wouldn't lose your property. And we are not in the business of taking away property uh, as mortgage finance institutions. We have also uh, done deliberate uh, financial fitness campaigns so that uh, we, we inform uh, and educate members of the public in terms of uh, you know, debt procurement. We have also engaged insurance products uh, to try and uh, assist with uh, credit insurance, uh, mortgage protection insurance. 
as a way of uh, uh, mitigating um, the risk of loss of uh, property. Affordable financing is a big one. Uh, I was hoping to see my friend uh, Ahmed Tut. Uh, we have recently procured uh, a long-term facility from the African Development Bank, uh, which is in local currency uh, and will be affordable, so we'll pass that benefit on to our customers. We've also uh, encouraged the shareholder, uh, the government, to, to open up uh, Class B shares so that new shareholders can come on board, and this will allow us to uh, reduce the cost of our uh, mortgages uh, further uh, with the reduced uh, uh, cost of, average cost of funds. We've worked very closely with the pension funds. Uh, it does say in the brochure that I'm chairman uh, for NAPS. I used to be chairman. My term ended, my three-year term. Uh, so no influence from me there. Uh, we work very, very closely with them. Uh, they have been a, a major uh, contributor to, to, to us in terms of placing deposits with us. Uh, we have a, a very unique uh, product with them where they've built some houses and then they place a deposit uh, with us to be able to give uh, mortgages using this deposit to members of the public uh, to, to buy the houses that uh, they've constructed. So that's on the affordable financing side. We have found that uh, there are supply constraints in the value chain, uh, and we have had to intervene. Uh, we took a leaf from CABS, uh, and I got permission from CABS to mention this. Uh, so we went to CABS and saw the model. Uh, we, we liked it. We made some adjustments. Uh, so we are working with the developers who have private land uh, to deliver houses at affordable uh, prices onto the market, uh, predetermined prices. We're also working with um, uh, local authorities to provide us with cheaper land so that we can reduce the, the cost of, of these housing units. As I said, we, we are also working with pension funds who have uh, housing units to, to improve on the supply chain. It's a big problem for us. The level of non-performing loans uh, is quite high. Uh, so in, in this area, we, we've seen that uh, there's need to segment our market further. Uh, so we are looking at uh, new products uh, for the youth, for instance, so that we can capture them early, uh, straight from school, before they get tainted by the market. They develop bad habits of, of not paying back loans. We want to encourage them to start by saving and then uh, getting a mortgage product from us. We are also looking at the diaspora. A lot of people in the diaspora have had their, their, their money taken away, uh, sometimes by relatives. You know, you send money to your brother uh, and he sends you a picture of the neighbor's house which is being constructed. <laughs> And when you come back, there's no house to come back to. So uh, we, we are working with uh, uh, the, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs to develop a, a diaspora mortgage product, which we will launch uh, to, to our colleagues in the diaspora. Uh, we are also looking at a pension-backed uh, mortgage. Uh, this requires a change in the law. Uh, so we are working with the Association of Pension Fund Managers uh, to see how the law can be adapted to this uh, uh, segment. We believe that um, you know, we, we can um, extend uh, further uh, by uh, segmenting this market between rural, urban areas, chiefs land. So we, we are looking at ways of, of, of uh, reducing the high NPLs. We've looked at uh, partnering, and, and we, I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, you know, Home Loan Zambia uh, has featured, we've discussed, they have a very uh, good model. They've, uh, as we heard from them, their NPOs are very low. So we want to partner and collaborate with them to see how we can work together. We place deposits with them to see how they can deploy those uh, by uh, increasing the housing stock. So with all these uh, interventions, uh, uh, Moderator, I, I, I would like to submit a thesis that we are uh, an asset. Uh, we, we pay uh, dividends to the state, although we are owned by the state. We are run on commercial terms. We have an independent board, and we've been paying dividends regularly. And as, as I said, our assets have grown uh, in the last four years, more or less doubled. Yeah, thank you.
what has been your you know, interest rates for their mortgages? I just want to see how different it is from the Zambia home loans that yeah. we had uh, some time in the morning. Yeah, well, our interest rate uh, regime, as we heard, and I agree with everything Trumbo said, uh, you know, is driven by <coughs> two major factors. The, the high uh, yield on government securities, which are the risk-free uh, securities, uh, and the high NPLs. Uh, so where, where you are seeing our interest rates sitting at 26%, you have to look at it in perspective. What is the inflation, for instance? Inflation is 8%. Uh, NPOs on average are above 10%. So, you know, our margins are getting eaten away. Uh, our interest rate is the lowest uh, Zambia National Building Society because we have a deliberate policy uh, to keep our rates lower. Uh, we want to work on the basis of... Uh, volumes, volumes uh, and, 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 and not necessarily on margin. So our interest rates compared to our friends, there's a differential about uh, 7 to 8 percent. But we still make money. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So I want to now hand the mic to Mr. Yeo to give us experience of uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Merci. Alors, je suis donc Yeo Kibenyari, directeur de la stratégie des dépôts institutionnels. Alors, je suis là pour euh, vous présenter donc euh, euh, l'expérience euh, de la Côte d'Ivoire avec la Banque de l'habitat de Côte d'Ivoire. Après les indépendances, les différents États africains ont créé certaines structures pour faire la promotion de l'habitat social. Plus d'une dizaine d'années après, ces structures n'ont pas survécu en raison des questions budgétaires. L'État voulant donc poursuivre sa mission de promotion donc du logement social a initié, a suscité la création de banques de l'habitat. Et c'est là que la banque de l'habitat a été créée en 1993. D'abord avec des, des investisseurs privés, l'État étant minoritaire, l'État à un moment donné a senti le besoin de réaliser, de mettre en œuvre sa politique de développement du logement social. Et donc, elle a procédé donc à une augmentation du capital pour en être majoritaire. L'État étant majoritaire, la Banque de l'Habitat n'avait pas les ressources nécessaires pour financer donc le logement. Vous savez que le logement consomme d'énormes ressources et pour financer donc ces, ces logements, on a besoin de ressources importantes, notamment longues. Ces contraintes ont donc conduit la Banque de l'Habitat à diversifier ses activités, on va dire, pour une question de survie. Et elle a fonctionné à l'équilibre pendant les 24 années d'existence. Et l'État, sachant que c'est un outil de développement, a décidé donc de se désengager, mais pas à n'importe quel prix. L'État a décidé de se désengager et de rechercher un investisseur de référence qui a les capacités financières et le savoir-faire. C'est ainsi qu'en 2016, l'État a lancé un appel d'offres international, au terme duquel la société Westbridge, société canadienne, a été retenue, puisqu'elle est spécialiste du financement du crédit hypothécaire au Canada, avec son expertise, sa capacité financière, elle a été donc retenue pour prendre les parts de l'État qui s'élève à 51,6%. Alors, quelle comparaison je fais La banque, après 24 années de fonctionnement, a été dans l'impossibilité d'accomplir sa mission première qui est le financement 
de l'immobilier. En raison donc des ressources non seulement limitées, mais aussi de l'absence du capital. Ensuite, comme l'État était majoritaire, toutes les initiatives entreprises devraient être soumises donc au ministère de tutelle. Donc vous convenez avec moi, une entreprise qui veut faire face aux besoins de la clientèle, les différentes lourdeurs administratives ont quelque peu freiné les actions de cette structure qui déjà n'avait pas les moyens de mener la politique de logement pour laquelle l'État a donc suscité sa création. Et donc l'avènement de Westbridge est venu donc résoudre cette question de ressources. Aujourd'hui, je peux dire que l'intervention d'un investisseur privé au sein donc de cette structure bancaire est un atout, tout simplement parce qu'aujourd'hui, elle a apporté des ressources adéquates, elle a apporté son expertise et le temps de réactivité face aux différents besoins de financement se fait dans des délais relativement très courts, contrairement à ce qui se faisait par le passé. Ensuite, la société Westbridge a mis le focus sur deux axes principaux, à savoir financer en amont les promoteurs immobiliers. Je crois que lors de la présentation de mon chairman, il a eu à lui dire, aujourd'hui on parle de déficit de logement en Côte d'Ivoire, ce qu'il convient de faire, c'est de stimuler l'offre. Et c'est ce que nous faisons aujourd'hui en finançant en masse les grands projets de construction de logements. Et sur l'autre facette, notamment la demande, nous soutenons la demande en apportant des financements à des coûts relativement réduits. Vous avez pu observer lors de la présentation du projet avec le Cayman, il a indiqué que relativement aux logements sociaux, la Banque de l'Habitat s'engage à financer à taux zéro. Mais pourquoi nous arrivons à financer, nous allons arriver donc à financer à taux zéro Tout simplement parce que sur l'autre axe qui est le financement des promoteurs, nous réalisons à ce niveau une certaine marge qui permet donc de subventionner les logements sociaux. Et aujourd'hui, nous sommes à cette euh, conférence pour montrer le savoir-faire de la Banque de l'Habitat afin que dans sa dynamique des partenaires au développement puisse également accompagner la Banque de l'Habitat avec des ressources longues pour que nous puissions apporter réellement notre contribution au financement du logement social. Donc je vais m'arrêter là pour euh, me prêter vos questions. Merci. Yeah, so thank you very much. I think that has been a very interesting uh, story and also how the private sector has uh, been involved in the process, the challenges you have experienced and uh, the more recent experience. I'd like now to turn to uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Hamed Dangiwa to give us the Nigerian experience as well. Thank you very much. Uh, isn't that different from uh, the first speaker and the second one? Because my presentation will feature basically on the preamble, then global experiences from various uh, roles of the government housing finance institutions. The issues raised against them, because there are issues raised against the government finance, housing finance institutions and some of the merits. And of course, uh, the experiences of our own bank, which is the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria, which is a secondary, former secondary mortgage market uh, finance house in the country. 
I will start that uh, most economies have adopted the prevalent philosophy of uh, market-driven approach to this uh, uh, housing finance. Nigeria is not an exception to that because our national housing policy of 2012 on housing, it favors the private sector-driven uh, housing finance system. That's why specifically in some of it, the approach has resulted in the creation of the NMRC, who the last speaker has said, the mortgage warehouse uh, funded limited and then to be established the mortgage guarantee. So the Nigerian government through the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria has fostered growth of private sector in the sense that uh, uh, the Real, Ex Real Estate Developers Association of Nigeria under the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria is our creation to, to the supply end. Then the Mortgage Banking Association of Nigeria who supplies the mortgages uh, funded by the FMBN are uh, eight. Secondly, the last one is the Building Material Association of Nigeria. If you look at the global experiences and various roles of the government housing finance institutions, despite the global prevalence of the private owned housing finance, other economics, both uh, developed and developing, have, have the government uh, finance institutions owned by them. Uh, These are uh, many, they play many roles. There are some that provide mortgage lending, like the one in Chile, Mexico, and uh, Thailand. There are the ones that provide mortgage insurance. There's one that mortgage uh, ins instrument guarantee. The fund management and mortgage finance is provided by our bank. We provided both the fund management because the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria is funded through the National Housing Fund. National Housing Fund is a scheme established by government to, pro to draw long-term funds into the pool. Uh, it's a contribution by the Nigerian workers. 2.5% of our income is uh, contributed monthly, deducted by, at source by the employer into the National Housing Fund to which a, a, a pool is created, to which a uh, uh, constant supply of mortgages is, is provided. So the other one is a construction finance which uh, the same bank provides, which I will discuss with it when it comes to what, what our experience is. The issues raised against the, the government housing finance, as said earlier, the biggest criticism of these uh, government housing finance institutions is the poor corporate governance due to government interference. You'll find that once it is established by a government, the minister of housing or the other minister or prime minister will keep on interfering on the way and manner you do your work and even the way and manner the board is constituted. The, this one always result to relatively poor profitability and the low financial performance uh, compared to the private-owned housing finance institutions. There is this uh, poor loan portfolio, you'll find that there is uh, high non-performing loans and there is low achievement of mandate. These are some of the issues raised against the housing finance institutions. But still there are merits to it, to which why should we have it? It serves as government agencies, uh, it serves as agencies for government's uh, intervention in housing markets. Because all responsible government would want to see that it's intervening in housing finance. Most especially as politicians or whatever a government will do. In some of their campaign promises, they will keep on saying that we will provide housing to the population. Maybe one of the things to draw uh, votes. So. It helps drive social housing agenda and programs and schemes by the government. You'll find that uh, in Singapore, example, uh, where 80% of the population live in public housing, and this 90% of it, uh, they're on their own flats. So the delivery situation in Nigeria, mostly of this kind of thing, is constrained by challenge of affordability due to low income levels. Our basic problem is that of low income levels, you will find that uh, the smallest mortgage is, is mostly unaffordable to most of the population of Nigeria. That's why this uh, National Housing Fund is a creation of government to draw the fund uh, in such a way that uh, those contributors, they own it. You will find that uh, if they own it, they do the contributions and then they come forward to get the mortgages. It can take on risk that uh, this kind of thing, it can take on risk that the uh, private owns are unwilling to take. You'll find that most of the private owned, they can't take much risk. 
the products of this uh, government-owned institution are more affordable and accessible to medium and low income earners due to the fact that they are not driven by a profit motive. Uh, not, uh, but at the same time can operate profitably despite the social business focus. In the sense that uh, we have some organizations that do that, the Fannie Mae and Fred Mac have used established flat track record of profitability after takeover by US government. So the experiences we have in uh, FNBN, which is the Federal Mortgage of Nigeria, as I said earlier, historically, it was established as a retail mortgage lender. Uh, in the sense that when it was established in the 70s and 80s, it was meant for the civil servants to, to get housing loans, to build their own houses or buy their own houses. But over time, you'll find that uh, most government workers, when they collect the money, they don't pay, and it's always an issue of uh, ejecting them or other foreclosure laws that has not been entrenched into the system. So the government now established uh, National Housing Fund. And through the fact that, uh, apart from the National Housing Fund, there is a primary mortgage bank, to which people, or the primary mortgage originates the loan from the off-takers. And then the federal mortgage man now provides the funding, and then it's taken over. That's why from there, when it established a mortgage lender, it moved to regulator, and then the Apex uh, sole mortgage secondary institution, because the regulatory aspect was taken over by CBN. So now what we do is that uh, basically wholesale lender and fund manager of the National Housing Fund. We champion construction of uh, financing in Nigeria, such as the Esther Development Loan, because we realize that uh, the, uh, most of the houses developed by the, by the developers are unaffordable due to the low income level of the workers. They can't afford it. So the approach is that uh, the, the bank will approach state government to provide land free of charge. It's of the state government. When they provide the land, some state government can even subsidize it by doing the infrastructure within the estate, all to increase the affordability and reduce the, the cost of the housing. Then from there, a mortgage loan, uh, uh, construction finance is given to a developer through the Real Estate Developer Association who manages, and then the houses are built, and then mortgages are created uh, in it. We have also the cooperative for the informal sector that is a cooperative housing loan scheme where well, cooperative societies can approach the bank with their own developer, their own designs, plans, and even the land. And then mortgage is provided construction finance to the cooperative society to build the houses and the mortgages are created for the uh, cooperative members in, in, in that. So this one has boosted mortgage origination by the primary mortgage bank. This intervention was required because commercial banks were not funding housing construction and developers stock away uh, beyond uh, the, the limit of the low and medium income earners. This is all achieved through the uh, NHF loans, which is the National Housing Fund loan. It's given at 6% over a period of 30 years. It's all because the cost of fund is at two percent. This is the creation. These are the full of fund we, we collected from the uh, contributors. When you are retiring or you, and you could not get any loan, we refund your money at two percent. But within that time, if you need an NHF loan, we give you that that loan. So FNBL is provided to provide these mortgages at uh, sixteen percent compared to sixteen to eighteen and twenty six percent we find in the open market. So that's why FNBN still remains the central affordable housing finance in the country, uh, growing in its loan portfolio through introduction of new products. We have the home renovation loans, which we give to, it's a microfinance uh, loan of one million naira just to renovate your house at the same interest, hope to pay over a period of five years, or you get the NHF loan or cooperative housing loan. Uh, currently, we are reviewing our Enable Act uh, to analyze the board and balance sheet. Uh, so these are the, the, the only way to do it. Maybe when it comes, I may talk on repositioning them. Yeah, so thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are running out of uh, time, but we have some time for questions from the, from the participants. And I'm sure... We, uh, okay. Good. Oscar. So uh, one of the criticisms that you, that you mentioned about state-owned uh, housing finance banks I think it was mentioned by one of the panelists, is the interference from the government. 
um, in, in, in multiple uh, ways, uh, one in operations and, and the governance structure, sometimes board and things of that nature. Is it happening in your institutions, and anybody can take this, or maybe a couple of you can take it, how do you handle it? I mean, the issues of a memo that you need to do this and while knowing that, you know, it's not probably the best uh, practice in terms of uh, what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, is it happening in your institutions? How do you deal with that interference? We'll take all the questions, please, before uh, so we take the two others' questions. There were two others' questions. Hi, Juliet Monroe from FSD Africa. Um, happy Independence Day for, to Joseph Tuambo and all other Zambian colleagues in the room. And a, and a question specifically for you, Joseph. I'm curious about your mortgage for women and how you're differentiating that product um, for women. You know, how, how do you make it distinct? What are the key criteria um, that, that it will enable uptake for women? So yeah. I think we'll take one last one and then we answer. Yeah? Last one. Okay. Uh, a question for Mr. Maraba. Um, you mentioned that the NHFC is about crowding private sector investment into um, various aspects of the housing value chain. Wh which areas in South Africa would you like to see more private sector participation? Thank you. Please, one minute's max answer per question. Thank you. So, to be fast, uh, Joseph? Or, okay. I think I'll take the question on the government interference. Uh, honestly, it happens in my country, especially in that bank which I head now. Quite well, it brought a lot of issues that uh, the bank uh, has faced over years. But uh, through our coming, I think we have to ensure that uh, that's why we are now pursuing uh, a bill in the National Assembly the, for it to strengthen it, to ensure that there, there is an uh, adequate corporate governance in terms of uh, membership and combination of the board and executive, to have executive and even non-executive members on the board and to decentralize authority, approving authority. You'll find that if there's a change of government from one government to another, before the government uh, established the new board to the bank, you have to be answerable to either the permanent secretary and the minister of housing or the minister of housing. So most of your board, uh, your, your own uh, approvals for, for mortgage loans, it has to stay there with them. So you'll find that instead of coming to you, people will be going to them for lobbying and then getting it done for them. But now with the, with the new uh, bill that is about to be passed to the National Assembly, it has reached an advanced stage quite well. Uh, this institution of adequate corporate governance is, is, in, in, is in force. And then membership and combination of the board is, is there. Especially now, I have been bringing the Labour, so Nigerian Labour Congress, the Trade Union Congress, that this money is meant for their own membership, to which that uh, they are putting eye to, to whatever we are doing. So these are some of the things. The strategizing approval authority is key to this, to ensure that some of the approval doesn't even need to go to the board uh, at the higher authority the, from the state offices or even the head of courses can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Juliet, for that. Uh, yeah, we, we, as building society, we, we took a cue from the government uh, when, when the government passed uh, basically what it was a directive to say 30% of all newly issued title deeds should be issued to women. Uh, so we saw that as a, a, a new market. Uh, given the background that um, traditionally women have not been encouraged to own property, uh, not too long ago, women had to get permission, either from the husband or the parent, a father, uh, to get a loan to buy a house. So it's not too long ago. So we, we, we decided uh, to, uh, to step in. Uh, how did we do that? We gave a concession uh, to women uh, borrowers in terms of interest rates, in terms of the fees. Uh, we also uh, made it easier for them uh, in terms of processing of legal documentation uh, so that there was a fast track uh, uh, system uh, for them to, to get their titles and for them to get their mortgages. It was a huge success. 
the board set aside uh, quite a significant amount of money which ran out in a short time. And we had to go back for uh, additional resources to fund uh, this, this product. Uh, let me touch on the governance issue uh, you've asked uh, uh, Oscar about uh, interference. What we are finding, certainly in our market, is even for state-owned enterprises, uh, public accounts committees of, of parliaments are becoming very vigilant. External auditors are becoming very vigilant. Uh, the central bank itself is quite vigilant, and we are hiding behind these institutions. So when we get uh, directives, we, we say, look, the Public Finance Act says this. So I'm sorry, sir. Uh, we are not able to comply. <laughs> Thanks. Well, another way to deal with political interference is having a shareholder impact agreement between the entity and, and the respective ministry so that it gets signed and so that performance is actually expected. The clarity of mandate is also part of the issue. But coming back to the question that has been raised around um, which areas do you want to see growing? As I did indicate, our business models serves both the um, supply side and the demand side. At the moment, two areas that we'd like to see being scaled up, and that's why we've moved to a place where we're consolidating within our business so that we become bigger to leverage better um, the private sector. One is the mortgage thrust. Um, we believe what has been delivered now, I mean, if you go back 10 years ago, um, South Africa deliver of mortgage was more than 60,000 units per annum. In fact, it was 120 units per annum. And then today it has gone down to 30,000. And what we're saying is that the scale can still be achieved if it is appropriately catalyzed. But on the, on the supply side, the developer finance is a challenge and would like to see that growing and especially in a transformational way. So those are the two areas that we can leverage the banking capacity to raise the mortgage. And on the other side, we can actually provide finance, a, a bridging finance in particular for developers so that the supply side can carry on. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much. Unfortunately, we can't uh, continue, and I don't know, there are very many questions, and uh, we, it's, there's a lot we can also learn, but uh, we have to stop here. I'd like to ask you to join me in uh, thanking the panelists for the excellent uh, intervention they've had. Th thank you very much. Merci aux panelists. Donc on aura deux interventions maintenant sur l'intervention réglementaire rendant possible, rendant l'investissement possible. Donc docteur Mike Michael Fuchs. Thank you. So thank you. Welcome again. So we have a very uh, long and uh, tough session, but I understand uh, tomorrow we have uh, a masterclass. So if you are not able to finish all the discussion, uh, you are most welcome to register for the masterclass. We have two topics for discussion. The first one is about uh, interest rates. And I think from yesterday, today, we're hearing about uh, the cost of funding, affordability, very high interest rates. We just had that in the previous panel as well. So Michael is going to be addressing that issue of uh, interest rates. Where do we have very high interest rates in Africa? What are the causes? And uh, how can those um, issues of high interest rates be addressed? I know there are issues that cut across uh, physical monetary policies and all those physical dominance, but I will hear more from uh, Michael. We'll also hear any ideas on how that uh, problem can be tackled. And then finally, if you can share some case studies of uh, where uh, this has been, um, all interventions have been successful and we have seen the cost of funding uh, you know, coming down. Those are the issues that I want him to address. And then for Pierre, I think uh, it's an issue about uh, the parcel requirements what that means uh, to the banking sector, access to capital, and also how they're going to be able to uh, operate and provide uh, you know, funding to the housing sector. What has been the changes from Basel 1, 2, and 3, and how is this being implemented in the different uh, markets? What kind of impact are you likely to see for the housing finance in Africa generally, and also the connections with the capital markets you know, eventually? So those are the areas i like you to address. But uh, let's start with uh, Michael Fuchs. I believe he has some three slides to share, as two slides to share as uh, he talks through the issues. Yeah, so Michael, this is uh, your, your chance.
Thank you very much, Evans. Um, the, 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 this is not, it's very difficult to give you a 10 minute uh, discussion on this topic, so I'm going to try. Uh, it's just a summary. And um, tomorrow we'll have a bit more time to discuss each of the issues which I'm going to touch upon now. So this is actually just a summary and an introduction. Um, this is, uh, by the way, the, um, the, the topic I'm talking about now is the um, subject of a working paper which I wrote for um, the Centre for Affordable Housing Finance and which you can find on their website if you're interested any more than just listening to me. It's always easy to write about, easier to write about these things than to talk about them. Determinants of high interest rates, which is the subject of this paper, I, I divided into four uh, different subcategories. Um, the f you can't hear. Um, the first of these categories is is uh, high high poli policy interest rates, which Evans just mentioned as well. Obviously, um, there's, there's uh, the foundation of interest rates in the economy aren't in the housing market. They're much broader, and they relate to um, monetary policy. They relate to exchange rate policy. Um, and um, so that's an area one needs to look at if one's going to look at why interest rates in the economy are so high. Um, the other determinants are perhaps more structural. Um, the next one I look at is uh, high credit risk premiums. Um, and these credit risk premiums, of course, have to do with the risks that the, the, those who are doing lending in the economy confront. So if, they have a, if, they're, if, if the um, institutional legal framework for, the, for lending is weak, risk premiums will be, credit risk premiums will be high. Um, in housing, it's very important with long maturities, um, and that actually makes housing finance um, as well as other types of long-term finance incredibly difficult um, uh, in, in economies with fairly shallow financial systems because there isn't really any pricing out in 20 years or 50, even 15 years. So you get what's, what we call high-risk maturity premiums on top of the credit risk premiums. And um, finally, in, and again particular to the housing sector, is, is how useful collateral is, and that, that very much depends on the legal framework and being able to identify property rights and more, more importantly perhaps here to be able to foreclose on those property rights if people don't make payments on their mortgages. So the second slide, oh dear, did I get, I've got the wrong set of slides here, that's a pity. Um, <laughs> I try to simplify this, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to go through this quickly because I, uh, this morning, tried to reduce the number of points, but now the number of points seems to have been, I seem to have sent the wrong side set to be put up here, or someone actually didn't put the right side set up because I sent them twice. Um, okay, so I'm going to go, I'm not going to go through all these points, and I'm going to tell you that right now, here and now because it's too much for a 10-minute presentation. But about the, among the things for the high policy rates that I wanted to highlight, and we can talk about them all tomorrow, is I think the most important one is fiscal dominance, which was just also mentioned by Evans. You have a narrow tax base, and um, you're, you're heavily reliant on perhaps commodity exports um, as a source of your ta fiscal revenues. You're very exposed to that, that, that risk as a, as a government. Um, and as a result, you, you rely on, um, at least during periods when you don't have that kind of income or that income falls, you rely on more government borrowing. And that tends to uh, mean that banks, um, who are the biggest providers of mortgages, um, um, rather appreciate that circumstance and buy government securities and stop lending to the private sector, whether it's mortgages or not. And for the other reasons in the other three boxes, mortgages are probably first online, so they wouldn't want to do it anyway. For the other three reasons I've got in these slides, the, th the three boxes. So um, it, it, unless government um, refrains from uh, too much borrowing, it, it's going to be very difficult to establish a market for mortgages. And on the high credit risk premiums, and again, I'm just going to choose one, um, the reason, I think one of the main reasons that these, these premiums, i.e. the risky, the risk, the, 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 the premium the bank puts on top of the 
um, policy rate because it regards the mortgage market as risky. Um, one of the reasons that, that those, rate, those premiums may be very high is because there isn't very much competition about, uh, in this market. Only a few banks really want to do this work. And that, that, that is um, not just in the, true of the housing sector, it's true of the SME sector, it's true of several of, of, of the more risky activities banks undertake. Um, then going to the th third box on the high maturity premiums, what do I think of those, of those different factors is probably the most important one. Um, I think they are the, um, I guess one of, I th there, there's a, the, the most important one probably is that it's difficult for banks to finance themselves on a long-term basis. So they're make, they're, 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 they are taking short-term deposits and putting them into a long-term, longer-term um, lending to housing. And they have a risk there on the maturity mismatch, which they can't um, hedge. It's probably the, lar the, the largest risk they're facing there. Um, another factor, um, which we'll talk more about tomorrow, is that institutional investors are very little involved in, in providing finance to mortgages, directly anyway. Um, and indirectly, they could be doing more. Um, then on the collateral values, well, I think that's... Um, uh, and, and the limited value of collateral, it's common to most African markets that the uh, registration of property is, is not automatized, it's not computerized, it's not reliable, um, and therefore um, you, uh, the, other, and the other part of that is that the legal framework doesn't do much for those who, who foreclose on collateral. There's, there's much more tendency to, to, to protect the debtor than the creditor and the legal framework. So that, 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 that would be the highlight there. I apologize for all the wording on these slides. It wasn't my intention. So on the third slide, I've tried to identify some even smaller, <laughs> in, in, in front, unfortunately, even for smaller recommendations on what you could do about this. And it follows from the discussion, really, from what I just said, that on, on the uh, policy rates, of course, fiscal policy, the, the fiscal revenues in particular, are important, and they, it's very difficult for countries which are trying to kind of establish a better platform for other activities to fund, for example, infrastructure um, and other activities they have in mind unless they have fiscal revenues or they use those revenues very judiciously. And usually that's not the case. Usually there are periods in which they, they're relying on, um, yes, and borrowing to fund current expenditures. So that, that, that's happening partly because, as I said before, they're reliant on commodity exports and prices of commodity exports are quite volatile. Um, in the second box, we have the credit risk premiums. And uh, as I said before, the, the, main, the main issue that seems to be impacting this market is lack of, uh, of, of competition in the, in the market among those who are lending. Um, and the competition issues uh, are largely dependent on the authorities. In many cases, central banks are, or, or supervisors, and they need to be within the central bank, but they usually are in Africa, are reluctant to take um, prompt action against uh, institutions which are weaker. And we have much, much larger number of institutions in most of these markets um, than are viable. And, and those kind of, uh, that kind of adds to the uh, dilemma about how to create greater competition. So it can actually be a huge hindrance to better competition rather than as you would expect or hope it would be supporting competition on a level playing field. On the um, maturity mismatch, um, there are there this morning, and you heard about that, there are various ways perhaps of resolving the maturity mismatch, and one of those is the liquidity facilities we heard about. In more advanced markets, you might also reduce the cost of uh, funding further by going for what are called covered bonds. Um, the, the problem with the liquidity facility is that the credit risk and the premium on risk remains within the banking system. So you're actually paying still quite a high um, credit risk premium and 
covered bonds might help to reduce the credit risk premium while providing extra liquidity on a longer term basis. And finally, um, on the collateral values, well, I think it's pretty self-evident that uh, a lot can be done on establishing a better registry of property and also to improve the value of um, mortgages as collateral by improving foreclosure processes. That's it. Yeah, so thank you, Michael, and I guess uh, the issues are very broad-ranging as well. So I'm sure we are not doing it uh, justice, but uh, we have an opportunity tomorrow. So let's hear now on the BASO requirements, as well as the additional requirements that are coming out of the IFRS, what that means for the banking sector, the access to mortgage financing, whether our capital markets are ready to be able to step in uh, to provide it. Um, you know, to fill in the gaps uh, and the challenges that are being provided by those two uh, regulatory changes. Okay, thank you. I'm wondering whether I can stand. Because you can stand. Okay, great. Okay, bonsoir. Uh, je vous remercie déjà pour votre présence à cette présentation. Et c'est juste dans la continuité des discussions. Voilà. Pardon, je vais faire la présentation en français. Les, les slides sont faits en anglais, mais je m'exprimerai en français. Et je vous remercie bien. OK. Donc, dans la continuité des, des débats qu'on a depuis hier sur les questions du financement de l'habitat en Afrique, la présentation d'aujourd'hui va s'atteler au rôle que la réglementation peut avoir euh, pour euh, encourager ou euh, ce que les banquiers remettent beaucoup en question pour limiter euh, la capacité des institutions bancaires à, à financer l'habitat. C'est généralement la perception des, des banques, mais le, la régulation a aussi un rôle de précaution parce qu'il est question aussi de protéger euh, les investissements des déposants euh, en cas de crise éventuellement. Donc c'est un peu ça le rôle de la régulation. Et il y a comme un trade-off, à, à, il y a comme un équilibre à assurer entre le, le besoin de financement de, de l'habitat et le souci de protéger euh, les déposants et de protéger euh, les, les investissements euh, qu'ils ont euh, confiés aux, aux banques. Donc euh, tout à l'heure, Evans a brossé un peu le, euh, les, les principales questions que nous allons aborder dans, dans, dans cette présentation. Je ne vais pas y revenir. Euh, en guise de toile de fond, je crois qu'on a, on a eu l'occasion ici d'entendre les différents intervenants parler des difficultés et puis du besoin de financement de l'habitat. Euh, la régulation, comme je vous le disais tantôt, c'est un élément qui peut affecter de façon substantielle la capacité des institutions bancaires à, à octroyer euh, le financement aux, aux gens qui ont besoin de, 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 de l'habitat. Et on a entendu parler des, des problèmes de, de, de créances douteuses. On a entendu parler des problèmes de, du coût de financement, on a entendu parler des problèmes de, 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 de ressources longues, les, les, les banques en ont besoin, on a entendu parler du besoin de, de, de la, la, la transformation de maturité, c'est-à-dire les banques qui ont besoin de collecter des dépôts euh, qui sont souvent à court terme pour pouvoir financer euh, les, les, les crédits immobiliers qui sont à long terme, donc c'est ça la transformation de maturité. Donc tous ces aspects-là, ce sont des aspects que la régulation contrôle. Et euh, la régulation intervient donc pour mettre des limites sur la capacité des banques à intervenir sur ces, sur ces différents euh, éléments. Et euh, en fonction des éléments qui vont être mis en place dans la régulation, les banques seront plus ou moins à même de, de, de financer euh, euh, l'habitat. Et donc, ce sont ces régulations que nous allons voir aujourd'hui, et en particulier deux, euh, les régulations de, de BAL, de BAL 3, euh, et euh, les récentes normes de comptabilisation des instruments financiers, les normes IFRS 9, comme on les appelle. Et ce sont deux principales régulations qui ont été prises depuis la, la dernière crise financière. Et ces régulations ont été mises en place particulièrement pour répondre aux critiques 
qui ont été mises en évidence par la crise. On s'est rendu compte que les régulations qui existaient avant la crise n'étaient pas capables de prévenir des crises. Et pour donc éviter de revivre le scénario de 2008, il a donc été convenu de reviser le dispositif réglementaire en vigueur et c'est de là qu'est sorti BAL3 et aussi les, normes, les nouvelles normes de comptabilisation des instruments financiers IFRS 9 sont sorties donc de, ces, de, de cette discussion. Donc, euh, L'enjeu de, de, ces, de ces régulations, c'est de protéger le secteur financier, d'éviter de minimiser, si on veut, euh, le, le risque d'occurrence de crise bancaire. Euh, mais euh, ça, c'est l'avantage des de, de, de nouvelles règles. Mais il y a ce côté aussi de, de, de contraintes que ça va pouvoir poser aux banques et euh, ça va limiter euh, leur capacité à financer. Et donc, ce sont ces aspects potentiellement négatif, ce sont sur ces aspects potentiellement négatifs que nous allons beaucoup plus nous attarder dans le cadre de, de cette présentation. Et euh, pour donner une idée euh, rapide sur euh, ce que c'est que BAL3, on sait que et ce sont des dispositifs réglementaires qui sont mis en place par euh, ce qu'on appelle le comité de BAL sur la supervision bancaire. C'est un forum international euh, qui euh, propose généralement des règles qui sont acceptées comme des, des standards internationaux de réglementation bancaire. Euh, ils ont 45 membres et un certain nombre d'institutions qui interviennent comme des observateurs. Euh, C'est vrai que le continent africain n'y est pas très représenté parce que actuellement, je, je, au, au dernier euh, nouvelle, c'était l'Afrique du Sud seulement qui était membre du comité de Bâle, les autres pays non. Euh, leurs décisions ne sont pas, euh, ne s'imposent pas forcément au aux États, euh, comme aux États africains qui, sont, qui ne sont pas membres, sauf que c'est accepté comme des standards, ce qui fait que généralement, les organes réglementaires euh, africains, même s'ils ne sont pas membres, ils appliquent euh, euh, le, les, les règles qui sont prises par le comité de Bâle. Ensuite, euh, voilà, donc, dans les, les dernières règles de Bâle, euh, l'accent a été beaucoup plus mis sur euh, euh, les, le renforcement des euh, normes de capital, de fonds propres et le renforcement des, des normes de liquidité bancaire. Donc, ce sont les deux principales euh, mesures qui ont été prises. Il y avait les prédécesseurs de BAL 3, c'était BAL 1, BAL 2, et ils ont essayé d'augmenter euh, les contraintes en termes de euh, disponibilité des capitaux propres et des, des, des contraintes de, de liquidité. Et voilà, euh, les pays africains n'ont pas tous euh, suivi les dispositions de BAL 3. Il y en a qui ont essayé de les adapter à leur contexte, local, euh, à, à leur contexte propre, parce qu'ils se sont dit non, les effets adverses risquent d'être très importants, donc nous allons suivre certaines mesures et celles qui ne nous conviennent pas, on ne les adopte pas. Et bon, C'est vrai que dans les dispositions de BAL, euh, ils euh, permettent ces discrétions réglementaires même si elles sont très, 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 très limitées. Donc, il y a des, des pays comme le Nigeria qui n'ont pas fait tout ce qu'on a demandé. Il y a des pays comme l'Afrique du Sud qui ont euh, appliqué tout ce que BAL3 a demandé. Et le, euh, la BCAO est même allée un peu au-delà de ce que BAL3 demandait. Euh, il y a les, les, les pays de la CEMAC, les pays de l'Afrique centrale, euh, qui ont également suivi euh, certains aspects de, de, de BAL3, euh, euh, particulièrement les aspects de des normes de fonds propres. Les... Alors, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on peut voir euh, des changements qu'il y a eu de BAL 1, BAL 2 à, à BAL 3 Parce qu'aujourd'hui, nous sommes au niveau de BAL 3, il est peut-être important de comprendre euh, quelles sont les principales innovations qui ont été apportées par le, le, le nouveau dispositif. Et si on regarde dans BAL 3, on avait la principale norme qui était le, le, le ratio de fonds propres qui était à 8%. Et au niveau de BAL2, ils n'ont pas changé le ratio de fonds propres, ils ont changé juste ce qu'on appelle le, les taux de pondération des, des, des actifs. Les taux de pondération des actifs, c'est quoi C'est que lorsqu'on prête, lorsqu'on fait un crédit à un emprunteur, euh, on doit pouvoir couvrir euh, l'exposition qu'on prend sur, ces sur cet emprunteur par des fonds propres. Et il y a donc des pondérations qui sont données dans les, la réglementation qu'on applique aux emprunteurs. Pour les emprunteurs, pour les crédits immobiliers, par exemple, BAL1 demandait d'appliquer une pondération de 50%. Ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire que si on fait un crédit de 1000 dollars, euh, ce qu'il faudrait couvrir, ce serait euh, le montant de capital qu que la banque devrait avoir pour couvrir son exposition sur un crédit de, de, de 1000 dollars. Ça devrait être de, de, de 50% de 1000, donc 500. 
C'est ça, c'est sur cette base qu'on calcule son exposition au taux de 8%. Donc ça veut dire que si vous octroyez un crédit immobilier de 1000 dollars, il faudrait avoir vos fonds propres de 40 dollars. Donc vous voyez que ici, on a deux éléments qui peuvent affecter la capacité à financer. Il y a euh, le taux de pondération, il y a également euh, le niveau de ratio de fonds propres. Et dans, euh, le, 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 dans BAL2, ils n'ont pas changé euh, le, 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 le ratio de fonds propres. Ils ont gardé à 8%, mais ils ont changé le taux de pondération pour les crédits immobiliers qui est passé à 35%. Ça veut dire que les banques pouvaient euh, octroyer beaucoup plus de... de